Welcome back to the Muzzle Blast Podcast, the official podcast of the National Muzzleloading Rifle Association. This week we're talking with artisan and craftsman Greg Murray from Tennessee. Greg is probably most known for his Crockett Long Rifle Project, where he's recreating original Crockett family long rifles. All of Greg's work isn't focused on recreating original pieces, though. He makes a strong effort and does some beautiful work of other traditional accoutrements that kind of have a Greg Murray spin on it. So if you enjoy the episode, be sure to check out the links in the show notes to see some of Greg's reproduction work as well as his original work. Of course, my name is uh, Greg Murray, and uh, I was uh, I was born and raised, not by choice, in the North. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> and I moved to Tennessee about 35 years ago. And uh, uh, while I was here in Tennessee, I was introduced to a uh, uh, to a uh, a man who is now uh, a good friend of mine, and his family is good friends of mine, uh, Charlie Hafner mm-hmm. uh, Jr. And uh, his his father, uh, Mr. Hafner. Uh, was of course a, a big competitive shooter at Friendship, and uh, Charlie was a or is a, a pistol shooter. So uh, in about let's see, I guess it was 1991. Uh, Charlie uh, invited my son and I out to his place at their gun range at Al Hall. And uh, introduced us to the world of uh, shooting muzzle loading rifles and pistols and stuff. Uh, and my, my oldest son, who was at that time nine years old, uh, he thought that was pretty cool. <laughs> and, and of course, I did too. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about. Uh, the world of recreating the American long rifle at that time. Um, and so I called some gun makers to uh, see what it would take to have a rifle made for a Christmas present. And of course, everybody that was worth, uh, worth talking to, uh, they were all booked two, three years and their price range was out of my, at the time out of my budget. So I uh, I decided I'd buy some parts and bought some parts for a for a rifle and uh, built my first rifle for Alex when he was nine for Christmas and it turned out turned out you know for a first gun fairly okay and uh, the fellow that I was working for at the time he asked me to uh, to build him a rifle. <laughs> uh, and it built, you know, built my second rifle, and uh, uh, it turned out, of course, better. And then a friend of his, and then a friend of his, and uh, uh, when I was ready to build my fourth rifle, uh, a good friend of mine, he recognized that I had some talent that I didn't know that I had, and uh, he commissioned me to... Uh, build a rifle and he, 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 he dished out a fair amount of money. And, uh, my fourth rifle, after I was finished with it, I took it to Mr. Hafner senior and wanted to show it off. And, and, uh, he sat down with me for a good while. And, and he, he finally says, you know, Greg, if I believed in reincarnation, which I don't, he says, but if I did, uh, I would have to say that you are a reincarnated famous rifle maker because nobody builds from scratch uh, their fourth rifle and does such a nice job with the architecture of the American long rifle. Wow. Uh, yeah. And so, you know, that, that was kind of the, that was kind of the, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, the, the, the final aha moment for me as an artist um, that I had discovered that uh, I had something in me that I had no idea was there. And uh, it turned into where I'm at today. Wow. That's quite the story. Thank you. I mean, 
I'll admit, I, I wasn't too familiar with your work. My father had started to share some of your stuff with me, and especially your your almost daily videos. I get a real kick out of. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so, the cup of Joe. <laughs> yeah, the cup of Joe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah. It's fun. <laughs> but that's that's incredible. How many how many rifles do you think you've built now since that that fourth one? Well, yeah, I guess uh, maybe a hundred, maybe maybe a hundred. Wow. Uh, somewhere in that neighborhood. Jeez. That's something. And that was, I mean, the, the 1990s, I would still consider relatively recent, you know, so you've not been doing this your entire life. No, no. I was, uh, let's see, I guess I was maybe 40, 45, 40, 42 years, 45 years old, I guess, when I built my first gun. Yeah, I'm 70 now. Okay. So, um, I've been, I've been doing it for a little while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have any background in you know no. whether it be carpentry or artistry and none of that yeah no um well i i shouldn't say no at all but uh i i dabbled in photography uh i, I did it on a kind of a semi-professional level mm -hmm. uh, um but that was that's the only uh, training that I had, and most of that was self-taught. Um, but I, I managed uh, horse farms. I, I was in I was in the horse business for about twenty years. Wow! And uh, did estate management, um, uh, basically a glorified laborer. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, no, I, I I didn't have any any uh, upbringing of any sort. However, um, as things progressed in my rifle making career, uh, we did some, uh, research on the background of my family and it ends up that we basically, uh, colonized America. We, we came over on the wind Winthrop fleet, uh, colonized Connecticut, and uh, down through the generations of my uh, mother's family, uh, there are painters, authors, inventors, uh, gun makers, and pioneers. Um, wow! So it 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 you know there was something there was something hiding in me that I had no idea about my family background or or what my capability was. Uh, but when it uh, showed itself to me, uh, I was certainly at that point, you know, dedicated and inspired to make it, make it my life. Wow. That's awesome. I mean, that's what in the, I've talked to a lot of people here over the last year or so now about muzzleloading, about people that have been in it for a long time and people have just recently got into it. And that's kind of a, a thread that continues, I think, through almost everybody that gets into muzzleloading is there's a certain aspect of connecting with their own family history, whether, you know, it was uh, manifest destiny or, or colonizing the East Coast here. All of that is, I think we can all trace our roots back through that in some way and somewhere down the line almost everybody had a muzzle loader. yeah that's right yeah yeah when it come i'm looking at some of your work now on my on my screen here and when it comes to like the engraving and some of your I, I for lack of a better term like metal paintings that you have set up here oh yeah 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 that's the that's the steel the steel can did that kind of come out of your engraving on the firearms and the muzzle loaders and you just it, it did Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Um, uh, the, the, the steel canvas art medium, um, let's see, uh, let me back up a little bit here. Um, in 1999, I opened a brick and mortar rifle maker shop in a historic village called Leapers Fork here in Tennessee. Um, and I had that brick and mortar for about seven years. But in the process, in uh, year 2000, the, the local community has a lot of artists, and most of them are plain air painters. Uh, some of them are sculptors and other mediums, but 
they hosted a art show and they approached me to participate. But the, the problem was that they were all doing uh, plein air paintings of a particular church building as the focal point. And, and I told them, I said, you know, I'd love to participate, but I'm a gun maker. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I don't know how I could even participate. And uh, they said, you know, gosh, your art is so cool. We wish that you could uh, do something that, you know, you could be part of the show. And so when I went into my shop on my bench, I had a, uh, a golden eagle cheek piece inlay for a rifle that I was building that was made out of steel with silver inlay. And it was all, you know, engraved and, and I had all my tools and everything laying around it. And I sat down at the bench and looked at it. And in my mind, I saw a plain air painting. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is. This is it. Uh, so I figured, why not use my tools and look at them like a paintbrush and use a sheet of steel and visualize it as being my canvas as a painting. So I went down to the church building. I, I, I took my sketch pad out and, and sketched out the church building, how I saw it, and went back to my shop and uh, started cutting out layered metals and, and brass and steel and silver and uh, did some sculpting to them, engraved them, and laid them all out, and it looked just like a painting. Wow. Uh, and uh, it, it clicked as being a steel canvas, which the sheet of steel is my canvas, and uh, my metalworking tools are my paintbrushes and so that's how that medium uh started huh. that's fantastic i i'm just that's just one of my own personal interests looking at your work i think that's really neat i think so many times we we think of engraving and metalworking as kind of a practical you know it's on a gun right. or it's on a knife it's on a, right. on a hawk and right taking it into right. the fine art space is really neat yeah thank you yeah thank you I, you know and it's not very often in an artist's uh, career that you actually have an opportunity to create a new medium in, in art. And uh, I, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't do this because I saw someone else do it. It just happened at that moment. Yeah. And, and I've done, uh, I think I've done about uh, 40 or so uh, different steel canvas uh, pieces in various uh, sizes. So I think the the big thing that I'd love to hear some about is the Crockett Long Rifle Project. I think as yeah. far as anybody that looks up your name or or searches for for you, that's going to be what comes up first. Could you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Crockett Rifle Project um, that started about eighteen years ago. Um, when I had my brick and mortar in Leaper's Fort, um, I was introduced to a lady who's a direct descendant of Lieutenant Andrew Crockett. And uh, at that time, she was she was fairly elderly, and um, we had uh, one personal. Uh, introduction and then we had four different phone calls and she was the owner and of course descendant of lieutenant andrew crockett and she inherited uh one of only three rifles that survived time that came out of ford's seat in brentwood that was made by the crockett family wow um so anyway, our conversations, she was a, a little um, afraid of people knowing about this rifle. And after our fourth phone call, she finally said, Mr. Murray, um, 
I am very reluctant to let anybody see the rifle, and it's in my it, it's in my home, and I don't want anybody to know it's here. Uh, so I would appreciate it if you would not uh, tell anybody, and I, I don't want to have any more conversation with you about it. Wow. And um, of course, I was I was really disappointed. Yeah, because um, I was hoping to be able to see it and 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 rec and, and know whether the documentation really matched up to the fact that it really is a Crockett rifle or not a Crockett rifle. And of course, I wanted to be able to reproduce it if it was a Crockett rifle. Um, and so anyway, long story short, about fourteen. 15 years passed and I never heard anything from her. And I just figured that was never going to happen. Um, I ended up with some pretty serious health issues at the time. And I decided that I was going to retire, uh, from rifle making, uh, because I didn't think that I could, you know, uh, keep going. Yeah. It's, it's Uh, laborious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I just didn't think that I was going to be able to continue. So I decided to retire and I put all my stuff, all my rifle making stuff in boxes and put them in storage and all that. And uh, I got a phone call and it was the lady that was the descendant who owned the rifle. She had passed away and her daughter inherited the rifle from her. And they wanted to continue uh, the conversation that I had with her mother about seeing the rifle, giving them some information about it and what its condition is. And um, uh, I told the lady, I said, you know, I would love to do that, but I, I've retired. I, I, I just don't know if I have it in me to, to do this anymore. So anyway, she was disappointed. And I was disappointed. I was, uh, uh, and went home, sat down with my wife in, in, at the end of the day. And so I told her about the phone call and my wife looked at me and she says, Greg, are you stupid or something? <laughs> <laughs> you told her that you didn't want to see it. <laughs> and, and so anyway, uh, I, I reconnected with the people and they came out to the shop. They brought the, uh, the rifle with them, the lady and her husband. And, uh, oh my gosh, when they took that out of that sock and we laid it out on the table, Ethan, it was, uh, it was goosebumps up and down my entire body. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, saw the original was in excellent condition. It had a few, a few issues, but nothing major. Um, it signed S and A C Samuel and Andrew Crockett with a maker's mark. Their maker's mark is a die sink of a flintlock rifle that's at the end of, of the S and A C. We ended up to, yeah. Uh, we ended up taking the barrel out of the wood, and on the bottom flat is a number eleven, a number uh, a number. Let's see, eleven at the breech, number nineteen at the muzzle, and in the middle is another letter C. Um. So, uh, I mean, that was like. Uh, I mean, how often does that happen? Wow. So we put the barrel back in the wood and everything, and we had a discussion about doing the restoration when it, it needed very little. And uh, so I ended up doing the restoration, and after that was finished, uh, I was commissioned by them to build uh, seven exact copies of the original. Um, after, after the seven, uh, copies of the original were finished, uh, then I've been given, uh, freedom to, uh, 
create, uh, which is now uh, under registered trademark, Crockett Long Rifle. Wow, that's just incredible. I, I'm just kind of imagining handling that original and just... It's, it gives me kind of goosebumps hearing about it. <laughs> oh, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it gets, it gets even deeper. <laughs> um, so anyway, after, after I finished the, the, the recreations, we had, uh, a meeting with five other Crockett rifle or Crockett family descendants. And one of them owned and had inherited two other Crockett rifles. No way. Yeah, two other Crockett rifles. So we have three rifles that came out of Ford's seat. All three of them are stocked in cherry wood. Um, they're all three signed SNAC with the the rifle uh, maker's mark, identical everything. Uh, uh, however, the two that he owns are in horrible condition. They 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 have they haven't survived well. Oh, that's too bad. Um, yeah, yeah, but. Uh, so then we have, uh, we, you know, we also have all of the paper documentation that um, clearly documents that these rifles that were made at Ford's seat are the only rifles in American history that have a Crockett rifle making family connection to David Crockett. And we have the lineage all the way from Samuel Crockett Sr. from France to Ireland to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where Samuel the Elder apprenticed rifle making. He handed down the trade to his two oldest sons when his third son, Andrew Crockett, who ended up being Lieutenant Andrew Crockett, when he was five years old, Samuel the Elder died. Okay. The two older brothers passed down the, the rifle making trade to Andrew. And then, of course, Andrew moved to Virginia and then landed in Brentwood, Tennessee, which is Brentwood, Tennessee today. And his two sons, Samuel the Third and Andrew the Third, along with Andrew, uh, Lieutenant Andrew, they established Forge Seat, who uh, supplied rifles to Andrew Jackson, and we have all the documentation on that. Wow! Uh, for the for the Battle of New Orleans. Um. So the history and the documentation of the Crockett rifle making family that are cousins and nephews of David Crockett um, and the family lore, and it's, it's pretty convincing that David Crockett stopped at Ford C uh, when he was headed to Texas. Really? Yeah. So is he just kind of stopping there as a as, to me? Yeah, he he was. Yeah, he stopped at Ford Seat uh, to say goodbye, and and we're pretty uh, confident that he took rifles from Ford Seat. Okay. Uh, with with him and took those west. Wow, that's heavy, man. That's that's really neat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very heavy. Yeah. <laughs> So I've got this booklet here in front of me of all the documentation. If you want me to kind of give some highlights as to what people might be able to research on on the Internet. That'd be wonderful. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. The first thing that you would want to look at is Esther Thompson's cabin. And that's through the Virginia Historical Society. Um, that's the beginnings of uh, 
Samuel the Elder um, at, at Fort Chiswell, uh, Virginia. So we have the documentation that, that clearly shows that Samuel the Elder was building rifles uh, at uh, Fort or at Chiswell, Virginia, and his rifles were no doubt used at the defending of Fort Chiswell. Wow. And then the uh, Sons of the American Revolution, uh, authored by uh, Fount Smothers, uh, if you uh, Google Lieutenant Andrew Crockett, Sons of the American Revolution, you will find the biography of Lieutenant Andrew Crockett. And it tells about uh, his ventures uh, as a a rifle maker. Um, Then in the Tennessee State Library archives, uh, the papers of Andrew Crockett, 1745 to 1821, uh, you'll be able to pull up all of the uh, genealogy uh, that connects uh, the Crockett's in Brentwood uh, to David Crockett. Um, and that information is taken from the Notable Southern Families, Volume 5, uh, the Crockett family. Um, and then uh, Googling Ford Seat, Brentwood, Tennessee, 1808 to 1826, you'll find documentation of uh, Ford Seat, which, by the way, is still standing. Oh, is it? I was wondering. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The estate of Samuel uh, the Third is a beautiful uh, two-story brick uh, home uh, in in full restoration. It's just gorgeous. And on the very back corner of that uh, home is the rifle making shop which is which is in pretty bad condition but it is still standing hmm. um and uh, we have we have a date set up that we're gonna uh get to tour through it oh that'd be great yeah yeah um and then if you google the general orders of andrew jackson Uh, November 24th, 1812, uh, he has the order for rifle makers in uh, Middle Tennessee area to uh, supply rifles for his um, journey to the Battle of New Orleans. Um, And then the Daughters of the American Revolution, I'm trying to find the chapter, I can't think of a chapter, I can't see it, but anyway, they were authorized by the federal park systems to erect a monument on the Natchez Trace at Timberland Park. And on that monument, it's a big granite monument, um, it states on the monument the fact that Ford Seat supplied rifles to Andrews Jackson's uh, War of 1812. Wow. Let's see, I've got, I've got one more tidbit of information here. Yeah. And I think I think this is I think this is the maybe the biggest <laughs> the biggest find in the whole project. Uh, let's see, in 1845, John Gadsby Chapman painted the famous portrait of David Crockett, mm-hmm. um, and in the portrait, David standing. Uh, wearing his buckskins with his hunting pouch and his uh, his uh, hatchet with his bowie knife, has his hunting dog standing around him, and in his left arm he has a rifle um, that he's holding for the portrait. And it's always been said that uh, that was that is not David Crockett's personal rifle because David uh, preferred very fancy very fancy rifles. Oh, really? Okay. 
so uh, in in the process of, of getting a uh, um, a download of the original scan of uh, the painting, the rifle that David Crockett is holding is a mirror image of the rifles that came out of Ford C. Really? From the painting, the wood appears to be, from the coloration of the wood, appears to be cherry wood. All three of the rifles that came out of Ford C are done in cherry wood. The rifle in the painting does not have a butt plate on it. Two of the three rifles that came out of Ford C do not have butt plates on them. The tang on the portrait of the rifle is about a two-inch tapered tang. Mm -hmm. All of the tangs on the crop rifles are about two-inch tapered tang. And from the appearance of the length of the barrel, they look like they're identical in their length. So... I am very convinced that the rifle that David Crockett is holding for this famous portrait is a rifle that came out of Ford C. Wow. And, and this, and this is, <laughs> uh, we have the memoirs of, of John Chapman's painting that was done by, that was written by Curtis Carroll Davis on March 6, 1836. Uh, well, no, that, that's the incorrect date. That, that's the date David Crockett died. Um, in the second chapter, or second paragraph of the first page, it states, uh, the painting showed Colonel standing among three of his hounds, left arm crook to accommodate his rifle, not a rifle, but his rifle. Hmm. Uh, and in the memoirs, there's about there's about twenty pages of information about uh, the painting of this portrait. So, anyway, we're we're pretty convinced that that rifle he's holding for the portrait uh, is his rifle and. Uh, it's pro it was probably his most trusted rifle right uh, uh, that he would you know if he was going to have a portrait he was certainly going to have the, the rifle that he wanted and uh, it appears that it's a rifle from Ford seat Wow and that's this that's the same kind of rifle that you're recreating Pardon me and that's the that's the same kind of rifle that you're recreating yeah correct yeah. Oh. So can we talk a little bit about the process that you go through of recreating these? I mean, on your website, it talks a little bit about it, but you're not, yeah. you're not building these from kits or parts. You're making a lot oh, yeah. of the parts yourself. Right. Yeah. Um, well, the first thing we did was uh, took the original barrel uh, to Rice Barrel Company and uh, Jason did all the measurements of the original barrel, and he is uh, re you know he, he's making exact copy uh, of the barrel, which it's a uh, it's a tapered to flared uh, barrel. Um, so that that was the first step. Um, then I did a mold of the trigger guard and I'm sand casting the trigger exactly as the original trigger guard was. And by the way, all three of the original rifles have identical trigger guards. Really? Uh, so then I'm, I'm also hand making all, all of the parts for the trigger. Um, however, uh, let's see, one of the, one of the original rifles, uh, 
was never converted to percussion. However, it doesn't have a lock. Hmm. The the two rifles that were converted to percussion uh, do not have the original lock uh, that was in the rifles, and they were they were converted uh, to percussion. Right. So um, I'm using either L and R Manton lock, which is identical to one of the rifles and then I'm using a uh, chambers late Ketlin lock um, um, when I'm recreating it in um, and then of course I'm stocking the wood from you know block of wood yeah uh, I'm not using not using any pre-shaped stocks hand making the front you know hand making the front sight and the rear side, I'm making the underlugs and making the underlugs their exact uh, copy of the original underlugs and, and of course, ramrod pipes. Wow. Um, so, it, it, you know, when, when Andrew Jackson, in other words, when Andrew Jackson stopped at Ford's seat uh, to pick up rifles at Ford's seat and when they opened the, the crate to examine the rifles, what I'm recreating is exactly what Andrew Jackson and his troops uh, uh, had in their hands. Wow. That's really neat. <laughs> I'm, that, that's really cool. I'm, I, I love history and, and seeing and hearing about this is just, is just fascinating. Yeah. Thank you. Now I, I, I want to make it real clear that the, the original rifle is uh, not, at my shop, <laughs> so, you know it, it. It's somewhere. It's somewhere in the south, uh, but it does not live at my shop. So you know, uh, it's it's in a very secure location. Right. You got your measurements and and you got your 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 patterns, and then it, it left. Ex exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it looks like you have a lot of fun on your website and, and on your Facebook page going through and making all this stuff. You're always posting some goofy selfies and, and you're posting yeah, a, a lot of really informative uh, little videos with your cup of joe and, and some several different slideshows. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. What got you into kind of starting to share that stuff? Have you always, uh, I mean, I think when it comes to muzzleloading, a lot of people feel like... We're, we're not that into technology, you know, we like the old stuff, but you're out here promoting your work and promoting the craft yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, my, my personal background and I, I'll, I give you this information. Uh, I'm not, I'm not afraid of it in any shape or form, but, uh, my personal background is, uh, uh, actually tragic um my 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 life as a child was was horrible um there was uh, mental illness in my mother's side of the family and uh i was a, i was an absolute train wreck as a as a child and even more of a train wreck as a young adult um and i if if in, in high school, uh, if there was ever an award for someone who was most likely to fail in life, I would have achieved that. Um, so when I was uh, uh, at my most bottom in life, uh, I had an experience with God, our creator, and um, through the divine grace of God, through Jesus Christ, uh, my life was totally turned around. And when I discovered that I was an artist, a gifted artist at a late age, I decided that I was going to do what I could do to make everything as upbeat and positive and an open book to people that I meet along my journey 
to give some sort of inspiration to other people that life can be good um, in some shape or form. So that's like with the cup of Joe, um, that's of course dedicated to my father. Yeah. Um, who he and I didn't really get to know each other until the last five years of his life because his, all of his life, he was, uh, uh, having to deal with, uh, illness in my mother's family and in my mother just to keep us on stable ground. And after she passed away, he and I had an opportunity for five years to get to know each other. And when he would come to the shop, oh my gosh, Ethan, we just had the greatest time together. And so that's the cup of Joe has been kind of my little thing that I do uh, on social media uh, to honor him and to share uh, what has happened with my life as an artist and just as a person. I think that's, I think that's wonderful. I think so many times, I think so many times that people see all the, all the perfection in other people's lives on social media. I mean, whether it's muzzleloading or or anything. And um, I think it's important to be honest out there. There's so many people out there that, you know, things aren't perfect, but it's good to share yeah. that and let them know that it does get better. And, and there's always yeah. something that you can go do, you know, and, and I think that, I mean, I personally have, have poured a lot of myself into my work and that's important, I think, to, especially to get through rough times. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's kind of what that's all about. When you when you first came on the call, they, you said you were um, you were unwillingly raised in the north. Are you a, a southerner by by spirit then? <laughs> by choice. By Absolutely. choice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I didn't choose. I didn't choose. I couldn't choose where I was born. <laughs> but uh, but I but I could choose where I wanted to live as an adult. And uh, when we passed through Tennessee. Uh, oh gosh, 35 years ago, my wife and I said, this is, this is going to become our home. And, and it did. So will you be at the, um, at the CLA show this year, as long as we can have it? Yeah. Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, wonderful. I have, I, I have table reservation. I was there last year and, uh, 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 according to everything I'm seeing on the emails I'm getting, uh, it looks like it's going to happen, um, barring unforeseen circumstances. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? I mean, I don't want to keep you too long. And I mean, I feel like I could sit all day (laughs) and listen to you. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, no, I think, you know, other than, uh, uh, other than my uh, custom rifle work, um, uh, you know, tomahawks and pistols and and stuff. uh, uh, You know, I do, I do some pretty crazy uh, out of the norm, uh, in the, uh, flintlock rifle build. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, I think we've covered quite a bit. I'm looking at one of your tomahawks here now where you've got, um, it looks like some branches and some squirrels cut out of it. Is that kind of, oh, it, is that it, his, it, a historical recreation or is that something that you just no. kind of have fun with? Yeah, it's just stuff. That, that's what I have fun with. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. The re- I, okay, that that uh, that brings up a, a point. Um, let's see, how do I make this short? It's kind of long. My uh, great great grandfather was Victor Morrow Griswold, who is the father of the ferrotype photographic process that was uh, that about 80% of all the historic uh, images that we have of our uh, Civil War were photographed on. Right. Um, Wow. Victor wrote a book um, that's 436 pages long 
in the 1800s. It's titled Hugo Blanc, the Artist. Um, you can find it online digitally. It's been digitalized, so you can read the book. And the book is his story of his life as a struggling artist and inventor during that period of time. Wow. And in one of the chapters, he makes a statement about artists in America and how they um, are... Um, let's see, what's the word? Uh, I can't think of the word. Um, they are um, hindered in being original because they only will copy one another. Oh. So... And that chapter in the book is is written of telling the story about how American artists only know how to copy each other. Hmm. And that was something that really struck home to me. Um, and that's why a lot of my artwork isn't a copy of someone else yeah so so my struggle and that, and that kind of opens the conversation in the crockett rifle project the crockett rifle project was the very first piece of art that i did that was actually a copy of someone else's work so that was really a struggle for me to work outside of the influence that my that Victor's book Hugo Blanc the artist had on me uh, to be to strive to be original in everything I do. Right. Um, so uh, that's what that's what that's all about. Hmm. So what in talking about that and, and that struggle a little bit. What um, I get, for lack of a better way to put it, what percentage of the time that you work is on the Crockett Rifle Project, and then, in contrast, how much do you need to kind of work on your own stuff to to flex your brain a little bit, or you know, to do something yeah. different? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, you know, the Crockett Rifle Project, you know, I was reinventing myself in, in the ways that I, I was, you know, attempting to do things that I'd never done before and didn't have anybody there to, to, to show me how to do it. Like mm -hmm. the sand casting, for an example, you know, I'd never done any sand casting before. So that was, you know, even though I was recreating someone else's exact copy or a copy of someone else's work, um, um, you're still handling molten metal kind of uh, flying yeah, by wire. I was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah, I was still, you know, you know I was still learning. You yeah. know, I was trying to do things that I'd never done before. Um, but yeah, you know, um, doing my custom stuff and that it, it's like, I'm, I'm reinventing my wheel every time I, uh, start a new project. Um, uh, yeah, it's it's man, it's hard. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on. I I you know taking some time out of your day. And I know you're busy and and you've got a lot going on. So I, I do really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm I'm always eager to share uh, what has landed in my lap. Uh, so uh, yeah, anytime anytime you want to uh, put something together. Uh, I'm on board, man. Well, hopefully next, um, in the next few months here, things start to open up and then we can, maybe I can make it down to Tennessee and see you doing some of this stuff in action. That'd be, yeah. that'd be wonderful yeah. to see. Yeah. You'd be, you're welcome. Yeah. Uh, my door is open to you, uh, you, you and Mike, uh, anytime. Anybody wants to connect with what I'm doing, um, 
they're welcome to uh, look at my Facebook page uh, under my name, Greg Murray. Um, they can uh, uh, go to the Cup of Joe. I have a Cup of Joe. Uh, Gre- I think it's called Greg's Cup of Joe page. Um, uh, then I have my Facebook page, Crockett Long Rifle. Uh, and then, of course, my website is uh, crockettlongrifle.com. Um, and they'll get information uh, about the Crockett Rifle Project. If they want more in-depth information about the Crockett Rifle Project, if they go to the Crockett uh, Rifle Facebook page, they'll see, you know, kind of a uh, progression. And, of course, then my Cup of Joe videos. That are <laughs> fun. That yeah. Fun. But, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, that's how you can get a hold of me and uh, 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 give me a shout. And if, if anybody wants to have me build a project for them, I'm available. Well, hopefully we can uh, we can swamp you with some work here. Keep you tied down. <laughs> We'd like to thank the members of the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association for making all this possible. We couldn't put on this show and talk to great people like Greg without the members of the National Muzzle Loading Rifle Association. If you're not a member, be sure to check out NMLRA.org to see what we're offering. Your membership includes a subscription to Muzzle Blast Magazine, which takes the same kind of interviews and articles that you're hearing about through the podcast and puts them in print with some nice photographs and some nice writing for you to read about each month. And that's delivered to your your door 12 months out of the year. Your membership also supports all of the traditional craft and muzzleloading education programs that we put on. During our major events, we have a series of traditional craft and muzzleloading safety classes that go on through all those events. And it helps us spread our love and your love of living history, muzzleloading, and traditional craft. If you're interested in building your own muzzleloader, be sure to check out the new Mike Brooks class that we're putting on in August of 2020. You can check out that event on NMLRA.org as well as our Facebook page for some more information. Mike is going to be taking you through the process of assembling and finishing your own Kibler long rifle kit. So you'll start on the first day. It's a five-day course. And by the end of the five days, your Kibler kit will be assembled and finished and ready to go shoot. So if you're interested in building your own Kibler kit, be sure to check out that class. We're really excited about it. If you can't make it to the class, we're going to be there with our camera crew to film and document some of the class to share with you. So even if you can't attend the class, be sure to look out for those videos a few weeks after the class, and uh, you'll be able to see how Mike Brooks is putting together a Kibler kit. We'd like to thank everybody for listening. If you enjoyed the show and haven't already, please subscribe to the podcast. Um, During COVID-19 here especially, we're looking to publish episodes weekly. So you want to be sure that you don't miss any of those. If you're able to rate us on Spotify or iTunes, we'd really appreciate that as well. It helps us get the word out about the show and uh, and reach some new people and, and share our love of muzzleloading and living history. Thank you so much.